Welcome, welcome everybody to Echo episode 127. Uh, thank you, Raphael, for joining me today. Say hi, Nico. Nice to be here. Hi, thank you. Thanks, thanks, thanks for everybody for being here, joining us, watching us live, or watching us, watching the recording later on. Um, and if you're watching us live, just uh, put in the comments whether you're on. Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever, wherever you're watching this, uh, let us know where you're watching this from. And uh, we are going to cover some uh, fun topics today. And it's going to be essentially a demo for uh, about 45 minutes an hour. I don't know how long it will it will last. Um, awesome. So first, we'll uh, start with the news of the week. Uh, and I will share, I'll share my screen. Okay, let's go. All right. Can you see my notes? Oh, not yet. Yeah. Now we can. Yeah, good stuff. Right. So we've got, um, um, of, we always talk about uh, recent events and upcoming events. Obviously, for us, it's KubeCon and CeliumCon. Um, Raphael, you will be there in Paris. Yes, I will definitely be there. You will be there as well, right? I will. I will be there, and uh, yeah, look forward to uh, heading back to my hometown and uh, yes, spending, spend some, <laughs> <laughs> spending some time with the family if I, I get the chance. Uh, should be good. Um, I, I have a session on the Wednesday. I, I better. I might as well plug it in. Uh, I have a session with Dan Finneran around uh, a reintroduction to the Celium um, uh, back to basics. Uh, that's on the Wednesday at eleven o'clock, uh, soon after the keynotes. Uh, but yeah, super excited. Um, you know, lots of really cool sessions. Celium Con has uh, lots of really good stuff. If you follow the um, Selium handle on LinkedIn or Twitter. They've been um, promoting a lot of the sessions that are going to be at SeliumCon. It's just looking really good. Uh, so yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing a lot of you in Paris. Yeah, will be nice. Cool. Um, and this week, uh, we heard about a new um, eBPF tool, which was launched and open source by Netflix. Um, Raphael, yeah. you uh, you had the chance to play with it a little bit. I don't know how, how what you it just a little bit, yes. Uh, it's called BPF Top. Maybe I can share my screen and show this. Uh, let's see. There, can you see my screen? Not yet. Oops, there you go. <laughs> So it's made by Netflix, and the idea is that it's a top kind of tool that can show you BPF information in a CLI interface. Um, so I actually installed it. It's a simple binary to install. Um, so there you go. It was a bit surprising. I'm used to installing my binaries with Z in it. I was, uh, uh, it's a, ZFS, a Z, uh, um, ZSH uh, um, extension, and so if you launch it, you'll see that, well, actually, you need to be root in order to launch it. And if I launch it with sudo, it doesn't work because it's not in the right path because I install it in some kind of weird directory. Uh, but when you launch it, you can actually see lots of information related to BPF. Um, this may be programs installed by Cilium or Tetragon, all the kind of information that you can usually get using uh, BPF tool, for example. Uh, so here you have it in a, in a, in a different uh, format. And you can see the, the CPU usage typically uh, per program. So I don't have a good one here. I had tested it before I had installed a, like a, a Kubernetes cluster, like a kind cluster, and started it with, with Cilium. And actually, you could see the amount of CPU that was used uh, by, by a specific program in the kernel. So that's it's pretty can be pretty useful to find out which uh, oh, you can see here. Um, which uh, which of the, the eBPF programs in your kernel are actually using uh, the, the the CPU? 
uh, and and essentially profile uh, quickly quickly profile your your programs. Very nice. Cool. Uh, yeah, Netflix. Uh, that was uh, the home of Brendan Gregg, who was like one of the big promoters of eBPF. Uh, I guess also one of the engineers who made it, uh, you know, popular and democratize it. So awesome. A um, couple of new Celium features. Uh, I I like to go and look at the. Um, I'll share my screen again. What I like to do is uh, going into the latest Selenium doc. So if you go uh, in here, you can see which version of the Selenium docs uh, so you are reading. So by you know, if you go on by default, you'll be on the stable docs, which I think now will be one fifteen point one. Uh, but if you look at the latest docs, you will see some of the features that will be coming out. Uh, with 116, assuming that uh, obviously the new features has have some more documentation to go along with it. Um, so there are a couple of uh, new features in in here. Um, so we've got um, uh, well, use a specific MAC address for a pod, um, and I I did a, a brief. Um, demo, which I posted on LinkedIn uh, a few days ago. Um, and it, it seems to me like it's obviously it's something that has been added to Cilium, which whereby you can specify um, the MAC address that you want your pod to have. And as you can see in this demo, you only need to add um, um, you know, annotation. And then when you deploy your pod, um, automatically that pod will pick up this MAC address. Um, and it's handy, and I've had a couple of people saying, oh, that's great, it's a great feature. It still feels crazy to me that we're in 2024 and that software licenses are based on MAC addresses. I don't know how you feel about it, but that's to me, ah, it just feels, doesn't feel right. The software licenses, I mean, it's, it's a big challenge, right? What do you base it? on <laughs> essentially it's trying to find something unique about your machine uh to to make sure they but that's not not really a mac address is not exactly a security feature right <laughs> yeah. it's easy to spoof anyway uh but yeah so that would be the main case the main use case right essentially a software that need a specific mac address in order to start yeah so i mean it's what it is. It's handy. It's going to be handy for a few people. Uh, I know there was, I think, at least another one CNI who supported that feature. So it's good that we have it in Selium. And that's coming in Selium 116. Uh, there is another feature which uh, you and I have been playing with, which is called Node IPAM LB. Um, wow. And again, it's kind of a like edgy, borderline kind of feature, right? <laughs> Yeah, uh, but I had I have seen it, you know, being um, asked for. Um, I guess the premise is it's a feature that is available with K3s, and oh yeah, so it's called Service LB in K3s. And I've had people saying, "Oh, when uh, can Selenium support a similar aspect where uh, essentially you?" enable access to um, a service of the type load balancer. Uh, but instead of allocating an IP using Metal LB or using Celium uh, LB IPAM feature, you use the IP of the node itself. Um, and tested this, uh, it works fine. Um, I, I guess it's... Uh, it's a bit, a bit of again a, a niche use case, and you, know, you have some thought about where it would be useful. Yeah, to me, this is essentially like like using a node port, except you can use any port you want, right? So you can use a privileged port. It's like using a node port, but on port eighty, if you want to. Yeah, right. Because you, what what Cilium will do is that it will actually not just assign the IP of one node and get all the traffic through this node. It will assign the IP of all the nodes. And you can go through any of the node IP, so typically internal IP for the nodes, 
and um, with the port that you specified, which means that you can essentially access the service through any of the nodes on the port you've chosen. So port 80, for example, you can decide that port 80 is the access to your service on any node. Cool. So we, we, have, uh, a, we have a comment on this actually uh, yeah. at the moment. <laughs> From LinkedIn, yeah, so you saw it. So Stefan is saying, oh, this is nice. Using service LB on my cheap hosting. So I'm guessing the use case is this, is you don't want to have to announce it through layer two. Uh, so typically ARP plus LBI PAM or using BGP. And you just want to have like a, like a little uh, cluster and you just want traffic to arrive on port 80, for example, on any of your nodes and get to your service. Is that, is that it, Stefan? Or I, I know there's a little bit of thing. Oh, what, what did I do? Did you do this? Did I do it? I did this. <laughs> I pressed on the on the space key. Um, yeah, is, is that is that really the, the kind of, of feature really is getting to getting to the port you want on any of the nodes so that you avoid actually using a load balancer. Mm -hmm. Yes. Awesome. Yeah, that's the challenge with doing like a live stream where you ask a questions and you know it might not be seen until like a minute later. So we'll uh, we'll, we'll we'll get back to that. Um, right. The um, uh, oh well, Stefan, the reply is coming. <laughs> I don't want to spend too much money for my private <laughs> hobby for the so exactly right. So um, yeah. I mean, it's good. It's good that the, there's a there's more again more more choices for for people to yeah. use Cilium natively to access their services in their cluster. Yeah, for for home labs, I think most of the time this so far people were using the new uh, layer two uh, load balancer option, which allows to actually um, assign an IP to your to your service using LBI PAM and then announce or rather reply to our request for this IP on your network. Uh, and it will attach the IP to a specific node in your in your cluster, and so the traffic will be redirected to this node. Uh, and this works if the router you have in front of your cheap cluster uh, actually allows it is actually allowed to communicate in L2 with your cluster. So if you're in a configuration in a cloud or something like this, where actually what happens between the entry point and your cluster uh, is not is not allowed to communicate on on ARP. Uh, then obviously this this is a bit more complex, and I guess this this uh, option of actually uh, providing the, the 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 port directly on all the nodes is easier. Yeah. Awesome. Right. And there's, so there's another comment, which is at home. I use Metal oh, yeah. and we'll switch to Cilium soon. So yeah, Metal is typically what was used for a long time for layer two and uh, or BGP, and you can now use Cilium for layer two. Uh, advertisement, or at least answering uh, our request for for uh, an IP associated to to a service. Yeah, and I I, I may have uh, written a longer guide to <laughs> you explain. <may> have. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to explain how to uh, to 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 migrate from one to the other. So uh, hopefully that will be useful to some of you. Um, cool. Now let's move on to the topic of the show. Uh, it's something we've, you know, we've been talking about doing for a while, Raphael, um, mm -hmm. amongst many of uh, the labs that uh, we have here. Uh, what has been missing is something which is focused around the proxy that comes with Cilium. And boy, in fact, actually, there's a bit of a historical thing on this, right? We used to. Almost two years ago, I think, maybe a year and a half ago, we made a lab called Service Mesh. And this lab called Service Mesh uh, featured the Cilium Ingress controller, which was really very new at the time. And it featured Cilium uh, Envoy configs as well. Mm -hmm. And then when more features were added to Cilium Service Mesh, we renamed this lab as Cilium Ingress controller. And now there's the Cilium Gateway API labs and Advanced Gateway API labs and so on. And we removed the uh, Envoy configs and made a new lab called uh, Layer 7 Annotations and Load Balancing. Um, so we've been thinking with Nico about actually refactoring this, re-adding a lab that actually talks about Cilium Envoy configs and some more features around Envoy uh, that we haven't really talked about since. 
in labs. And so we've been working on refactoring the essentially the layer seven annotations lab uh, into a generic uh, Envoy lab. So Cilium Envoy lab. Uh, the lab is not entirely ready. <laughs> we've been working on it this week, but we're going to run through what it is now <laughs> and go through it. So this is also your opportunity if you're following along today to give feedback on this and, and ask questions or let us know if there's things that are unclear or things that could be done better. Or if you have ideas, even for the exam, for example, you know, we're not going to spoil. The exam is not written yet, but if there's ideas floating around, it might, might be fun. Yeah, and the exam should uh, actually, the Cilium Certified Associate exam should be GA very soon from uh, mm -hmm. what I heard. So um, uh, perfect timing. Uh, Envoy is actually a key part of Cilium. You might actually be using Envoy whenever you use, well, for when you use Cilium. Uh, and it's actually for when eBPF is not capable of uh, doing like layer seven processing, Cilium tends to leverage the Envoy proxy to um, you know, manipulate packets at that application layer. Yeah, that's really the idea. In Cilium, we try to do as much as possible with eBPF. And some of the layer seven observability can be done with eBPF. In fact, we do uh, quite a bit of this in Tetragon, and it's it's going to be coming to Cilium at some point because there is the, the logic exists to observe uh, things like HTTP traffic in eBPF. But the routing and security for uh, layer seven is often a bit too complicated, especially the statefulness of some connectivity uh, is, is a little bit complicated to manage with eBPF with, with the size of the maps that can be that can be used. Um, so yeah, at this point, this is this is really the approach like uh, like uh, uh, Nico is showing now. Uh, everything that can be done with eBPF, we try to do with eBPF because it's more performant because it's not dependent on user space programs and, and the stability of user space uh, programs. Uh, and anything that we cannot do yet will delegate to a proxy. And Envoy is used for this because Envoy is a great and performant and very featureful layer seven proxy. Yeah, and I was re-watching the Envoy documentary, which uh, came out uh, last year, uh, similar to you know the EBPF documentary, uh, like produced by the same team, actually uh, explains the history behind the project, which was initially started at Lift uh, by Matt Klein, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and um, I'll put it in the chat. There you go. And we're talking yeah. entry. <laughs> and it became part of the, obviously, a lot of the service mesh implementations leverage uh, the Envoy proxy uh, for a lot of their traffic management capabilities. Um, so, yeah, we, we, a number of features within Cilium use uh, the Envoy proxy. Um, and we'll see in the lab that there are a couple of different ways um, and different models where Envoy is deployed within the Cilium architecture. So we'll, we're going to look at, look at this. And we're going to take a look at um, what happens again when we use uh, Envoy for um, so let's start with the labs and, uh, and yeah. Raphael, you will go, you will go through it. Yes. Yeah. Good. It's starting now and, and it's going to take another minute to start. So, and I don't have a lot of notes. The notes are still from the old <laughs> lab actually haven't been totally updated. So the idea with this lab will be, uh, generally, uh, talking about Envoy. We can look at the, the different parts we'll have. So we'll look at the lab environment. We'll look at HTTP network policies. Obviously, there's, there's other labs that talk about HTTP network policies. Maybe we'll try to go a little bit further on this. Uh, this is not entirely written, but maybe we'll, we'll do this during this uh, this ECO episode, trying to dive a little bit more into what this means. Uh, then a new feature that was introduced in Cilium 114 is the possibility of deploying Envoy as a separate daemon set from the Cilium uh, daemon set. We'll talk about observability, HTTP observability in particular. Envoy can do more than just HTTP. And so in Cilium, you can actually have like Kafka or Cassandra 
uh, observability as well. We essentially focus on HTTP because this is still the main use for most people, essentially is HTTP, gRPC. Uh, talking about gRPC, actually, we'll be deploying a gRPC application and talking about gRPC load balancing in Cilium, uh, internal load balancing. And then we'll have an advanced use case using a Cilium Envoy config for circuit breaking. This is just an example. Cilium doesn't have an abstraction for circuit breaking at the moment, but you can still do it by uh, programming Cilium, by programming Envoy, sorry, uh, yourself using a Cilium Envoy config. And then the quiz and the challenge are not written yet, so this is still to be done. So now the lab it started as usual with our labs. Uh, it's essentially a virtual machine that is running uh, in the cloud. It's actually running in GCP. And so we get we get a virtual machine. We can do whatever we want with it. We are actually root on the machine. And as usual with the labs, we have a kind cluster that is available. Uh, this is this is the useful thing with the kinds of labs. Sorry, this is the useful thing with this kind of lab is that is that the whole environment is provided. So the cluster is already started, and Cilium is already installed as well. Uh, and we can see uh, since we're using we use Cilium install, so the Cilium CLI to install Cilium. And in the the recent versions of Cilium CLI, it actually uses Helm to install. So if we look at Helm. Um, we can see that Cilium has been installed in version 115. And we can actually even see the values that we used. Uh, no, it's not get values. Uh, get values Cilium, sorry, my bad. So these are the, the user supplied values. Let's colorize them, It'd be nicer. So uh, most of these values were actually provided automatically by Cilium CLI when we installed. So we just type Cilium installed and it's detected the type of cluster and filled in these values automatically. So we have uh, the cluster is called kind kind by default because it's a kind cluster. Uh, Hubble is actually activated where I told uh, Cilium to activate Hubble. We're using a node port. This is because of the environment here. It makes it easier to access Hubble uh, in, in tabs in my environment. And then what else? There's, there's nothing really special about this setting at this point, except that two proxy replacement is activated. Uh, and this will be necessary for some of the features we'll be using. And because two proxy replacement is uh, set up, we also need to provide the Kubernetes service host and Kubernetes service port, which is automatically detected when you do Cilium install. So when I, I said Cilium install and two proxy replacement strict or true, uh, then it will automatically get the service host and service port and provide them as values. So this is done. We can verify that QProxy is actually activated. If you check for Cilium config view, it's set to strict. So we can get started. Cool. Again, if you have any questions uh, while we're going through uh, this, uh, we, well, I don't think we, either of you claim to be our Envoy experts. We, we're going through a journey of discovery. We've been using Envoy, um, you know, through this uh, and enjoy discovering some of the, the you know, features and, and aspects of, of Envoy. Yeah. But yeah, if you have any questions, comments, just feel free to add them to the chat. So we're starting by uh, deploying the, um, you know, our, the standard Star Wars demo app, right? Yes, yes. And if you've taken the Cilium Getting Started Lab, this is pretty much the, the scenario for this specific challenge, right? We have uh, two Death Star pods. We have a TIE Fighter and an X-Wing. And the idea is we want to secure the Death Star. Yes, that means we're on the bad side <laughs> for this for this uh, scenario. And some people have told us, you know, you, you're, you're saying yourself on the bad side by securing the Death Star, but that's just how it is, right? It's e e easier for this uh, challenge. So if we go into the X-Wing and we do a curl on the Death Star at the moment, we have no network policies. So Death Star uh, defaults.svc cluster local. And let's do a request landing. And we need to use, so let's make it silent and it's post. Then you see that we're allowed to land on the Death Star. And this is bad. So the first step is really uh, to secure using an L3, uh, L4 network policy. We can look at it. Um, 
So by the default, LTE. the network policy, before we deploy network policy, we've got a free for all. There's no restrictions. Every pod can talk to any other pod. Yes. In the yes. So at the moment, every pod can talk to, to any pod, right? Uh, so now we've put a restriction. And this restriction is an L3, L4 policy, which applies to the Death Star. So class Death Star, org equals empire. These are two labels that apply to the Death Star pods. And it allows ingress from any pod that has or equals empire to the ports, uh, port 80 protocol TCP, that's the port of the desktop. So this is a layer four um, network policy, right? This part here under ingress is layer three. Layer three is essentially saying uh, any pod that is labeled or equals empire is allowed to talk to the desktop. And layer four makes it a little bit more specific to say only if you're using port 80 protocol TCP. So now that we have this in place, if we look at the pods here, we see that, yes, the death stars have class equals death star and all equals empire. Uh, the TIE fighters have class equals TIE fighter or equals empire, but the X-Wing, if you're familiar with, uh, with Star Wars, the X-Wings have class equals X-Wings or equals alliance because they're rebel ships and not imperial ships. So now if we do the comment that we had before, now we're not allowed to reach the Death Star anymore. So we'll get a timeout after a little bit of time. Um, I'm going to stop this. I'm going to do Control C. And we can actually observe in the default namespace that we get traffic that is dropped from the X-Wing to the Death Star. The traffic is dropped. OK, so that's fine. The problem is, if you know Star Wars, you know where I'm going. Um, we're allowed now still fully to access the Death Star from the TIE Fighter. Why? Because the TIE Fighter has an org equals empire label. Mm -hmm. uh, but we know that there is a security issue with the Death Star. And the security issue is that if you put, if you're allowed to put something, to put a bomb in this case, uh, a missile inside the exhaust port, then you can destroy the Death Star. The Death Star explodes. Right. Obviously, so you're not allowed to do this from the X, right? Sorry? Yes, yeah, so there's a vulnerability on, on, on our on It's our, a vulnerability, yes. Yeah. So normally, normally this would not happen, right? The Empire is not likely to do this. But what if someone actually took a vessel from the Empire and used it to do this because they actually have the right to? Because the L3, L4 uh, network policy doesn't prevent you from accessing the Death Star. It allows you to access the Death Star. Right? So how could we prevent this? Obviously, we can't prevent TIE fighters from accessing the Death Star. They are Imperial vessels. They need to access the Death Star for many things. So we need to actually restrict the kind of access that happens. That means we need to actually act at layer 7, because layer 3, layer 4 is still the same. It's still uh, uh, The label is still class equals Empire to uh, identify the source. That's layer 3. And as far as layer four, this is still port 80 protocol TCP. There's no way to distinguish at this le at this, this level. What we need instead is to make it so that we know what is the verb that is used, what is the method, so put or get or post, and what is the path that is used. Potentially, we could also filter on headers and so on. So in order to do this, we're going to apply the layer seven network policy. So let's look at it now. We've actually just replaced the existing policy. We could create a new one as well. So the spec now is this. We changed the description as well. It's a layer seven network policy. So we still have the layer three part here, which says it's only vessels with or equals empire. So the X-Wing won't be able to access anyway. There's still layer four here, which is the port uh, selection. But in addition, we added a new part, which is an extension of the layer four rule. You can tell here it's aligned with the layer four rule. And it says rules HTTP method post pass v1 slash request landing, which means that only this request, only a post request on this path is allowed. So what's the link with Envoy here? <laughs> you could say, right? Um, in Cilium, like we said before, we try to do as much as possible in eBPF. So the layer three enforcement is done in eBPF. It can be done in eBPF, it will be done in eBPF which means that the kernel on the machines are, is self-sufficient 
to filter this traffic based on labels. It knows about the labels associated with source and destination traffic. And, and sorry to interrupt, but this, this labels essentially, we, there is a kind of almost like a conversion into IP address, right? Yeah, and that can depend on the way you're actually uh, installing and configuring Cilium. Uh, typically, if you're using uh, Overlay, then the, the identity is actually passed with the packets between the nodes. Uh, if you're using direct routing, for example, then Cilium will base itself on an IP cache that is shared between the agents to map uh, the, the identities. And then the identities are mapped to uh, these, um, these labels. So we can see here, if we look at the pods, uh, we see the, the Death Star pod, for example. Uh, let's look at TIE Fighter for today. Let's look at the TIE Fighter pod. Uh, we have Cilium um, identities. And you see here the Cilium identities. Uh, we won't see it this way. Let's look at the Cilium endpoints instead. And you see there's one endpoint per pod that is managed by Cilium. So we have an endpoint for the TIE Fighter. And we can see the security identity that is here. And this security identity is listed here in the identities. Now, if we look at the identity, selling so identity, and we look at the one that is associated with the TIE Fighter, and let's do bash or YAML, then we can see that the security labels that are associated, and these are the labels that identify this pod. These are the labels associated to the pod. So it had classical TIE Fighter, uh, app Kubernetes IO slash name equals type fighter. There is there are some uh, labels associated to the namespace where it's running to the service account it's using, and all these labels can be used to identify this pod. So when Cilium applies a network policy, it will check what identity applies to the source and destination of the traffic. So for layer three here, eBPF is sufficient. For layer four, eBPF is still sufficient. For layer seven, we need to actually parse the traffic here and uh, the, the, the HTTP traffic and modify this HTTP traffic potentially. So we cannot do this in eBPF at the moment. So let's see what happened already. When I applied this rule, now if I do the request, if I make the TIE Fighter request to the Death Star, um, I still don't get kicked, but I get an access denied. Access denied means I actually get a response which is a 403 forbidden. So what happened here? What happened is that once the layer three and layer four rules in the Cilium network policy were matched properly, so the pod, the traffic is allowed to, proce to process because the source was verified against these rules, then the traffic is actually sent to Envoy. And Envoy has been configured to apply this rule. And so we'll get a response from Envoy. And Envoy, having been configured to only allow this traffic, will reply with 403 because this traffic is not allowed. So this is actually Envoy that is replying here. Yeah, you you, are, you um, also see uh, server Envoy, right? So you're even getting the reply above that Envoy. Is, yes, I can actually see yeah. here server Envoy. Exactly. This uh, this um um a header that was added to the reply uh, to say that this is Envoy. And if I do a post on request landing, which should still be allowed, I'm still allowed, I get a 200, and still go through Envoy, right? So this is transparent. Um, I, as far as the, the TIE header is concerned, you still get access, but it's actually proxy through Envoy, and it's Envoy that applies this rule. Um, so how does this work? The way this works actually currently is that in the Cilium pod, there is an Envoy uh, um, uh, server that is started and will process this request. Uh, so we we'll, we can look at this in the next step. Yeah, and actually, I mean that's something that is. I wasn't clear to me when I first started to look at, at, at Cilium is is actually deployed on when you need that feature right? that envoy process is deployed when that layer seven policy has been yeah, yeah. until now at least until now it's deployed yeah. on the fly when we need it yeah um 
So by default at the moment, Envoy is a process in the ceiling agent, and we'll see how we can make it a separate daemon set. So if we look at how it is now, let's just start, let's just start uh, uh, making the TIE fighter making request to request landing, right? So there, it's it's requesting landing and it's able to land. And we know now that this goes through Envoy. Um, and what we're going to see is, well, let's not do this step here. Let's just go straight to here. And we see here that there's actually no Envoy pods running. It's not in Cube system, but even if we look at all the, the namespaces, um, If we look at all the namespaces, there's nothing related to Envoy here. So how does it work in Cilium by default? The way this works is, we're going to look at this. Let's take the, the node where one of the test stars is running, right? And then we'll find the Cilium agent running on that node. So in this case, it runs on kind worker, and the agent is Cilium uh, BMPK8. So if we look inside the Cilium BMPK8, we see that there's an Envoy uh, process that has been started. This is Cilium Envoy starter that is running. Uh, in fact, there's two of them. And these uh, these starters are actually, this, this Envoy processes are actually what processes the, the, the network policies, right? So they add an Envoy listener, and this Envoy listener is attached to the, the CNP, to the Cilium network policy, so that when the layer three, layer four parts of the Cilium network policy pass, then the traffic is redirected to the Cilium Envoy listener that was generated for this network policy. And then this Envoy listener might just let traffic through, or it could return a 403 like we, we got before. But the traffic won't be dropped. It was redirected into, into Envoy, and it won't be dropped. And the, the, so you've got, you've got three nodes and three Cilium agents, but you yes. don't have three Cilium. Oh, we can check. Uh, uh, if we look at the Cilium CGF block. This one has it as well, because there's also a Death Star running on this one, I think. But we only have two Death Stars, so. On the last one, there shouldn't be one. Yeah, you see on this one, we don't find there's no there's no envoy running in this in this container. Yeah, so, so that's envoy is started today. whenever we need it. Hmm? Yeah, and so as a behavior today, and envoy started, but it's only on and because it's the network policy was set up in ingress, applying to the Death Star pods. Yes. So it's only going to be deployed on the nodes where there is a Death Star pod running. Yes, exactly. And Death Stars are running on Kind Worker and Kind Worker 2, right? So on both of these, you'll have uh, an Envoy that is running, but not on the control plane. Awesome. So now what we can do is, for several reasons, you might want to actually separate the Envoy uh, um, process from Cilium to have it running separately. So there is this option to Cilium 114, right, from last year. Uh, and it's actually going to become the default in Cilium 116, which is the next major release of Cilium. Uh, so what we can do is we're going to upgrade Cilium with that option. So we start by um, adding the, the Helm repo, because for now we were installing with Cilium installed, so the Helm repo was not there. And we're going to use this. But as I showed you, Cilium install actually installs Cilium using Helm. So if we just upgrade Cilium with the same version, we reuse the values and we just add a new value, which is envoy.enabled equals true. Then this envoy.enabled equals true will actually enable Envoy as a separate daemon set. This is the option to do it. So yeah, Cilium Envoy is running. And it might go through some weird states while it's integrating. I've seen this before. <laughs> Where Cilium Envoy is starting to is trying to start, but because Cilium hasn't restarted, um, what happens is that in this new configuration, let's say before, the, 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 the system changes now, right? When Envoy is started as a process inside the Cilium pod, it 
communication is done using a Unix socket, right? Uh, there is a Unix socket uh, that uh, is inside the pod and is, is shipped. Um, with the with Envoy deployed at the demon set, it still uses a Unix socket with a volume, but it's instead of Cilium generating the configurations and passing them directly to the Envoy process, it will actually send the, the information to configure Envoy using a protocol called XDS, which is a protocol to control how Envoy uh, uh, generates this uh, configuration. Um, so the Cilium agent and the Cilium Envoy uh, pods must communicate using an XDS socket. And so obviously the Cilium agent needs to be restarted to know that it needs to communicate with Cilium Envoy. So both the Cilium agent and the Cilium Envoy pods have been uh, started or restarted so that it can communicate like this. So now there shouldn't be a Cilium uh, process anymore in any of the Cilium um, pods. So image and pause, if we look at where we had it before, like it's now called Cilium uh, T4G2V, obviously the name has changed because we've restarted the demon set, but this is still the Cilium pod managing one of the death stars and there's no uh, envoy in there anymore. Um, in addition, what we can see is now the envoy logs that used to be in the Cilium pods are now in the envoy demon set pods. Uh, there's other benefits to this. Typically, if you want to upgrade uh, potentially Envoy, because let's say there is a security problem with, with Envoy, you want to upgrade it separately from the Cilium agent, then you can do it because it's a separate demon set. And what's coming soon in 116 as well is improvements. And typically, what you can see here, this is not, ex not, not perfect yet, uh, but if you restart at the moment, Roll out, restart, demon set Cilium. If you restart uh, the Cilium demon set, there's still a little bit of an impact when uh, on on layer seven traffic. And this is this is the thing, really. When you use only layer three, layer four network policies, it's all done using eBPF. There's absolutely no impact on traffic if you restart the Cilium agent. At the moment, there's still impact on traffic when you use layer seven, but this is going to uh, pretty much disappear in the future uh, by improving the communication between the Cilium agent and the Cilium uh, uh, Envoy demon set, uh, such that when the Cilium agent restarts, it shouldn't have any impact on what the Cilium uh, Envoy demon set is actually uh, doing. At the moment, there's still some impact because there's still some, when the Cilium agent comes up, it still exchanges information and, uh, and it's not, there is a time of synchronization that makes this happen, and this is going to be fixed uh, soon. I think I saw the pull request today, actually, for this. Cool. Now, so we get Envoy deployed as a daemon set, uh, and it's at least it's do, we know it's doing some of the network policy uh, at the layer seven. Uh, so, what else can it do for us? Well, let's yeah, let's move to the next section. <laughs> So we have network policies in place, and network policies are also what is used for observability in Cilium, for layer seven observability. Because we're getting the traffic to Envoy, Envoy parses the layer seven layer, and it can also give us observability, show us exactly what's happening. So one way to do this in Hubble is we can use type trace to proxy, and this will show, this is a special type of, of trace uh, that that shows uh, the, the the traffic that went through the proxy. In this case, this is the HTTP proxy. There could be other proxies like the DNS proxy when using the the Cilium um, DNS proxy. Uh, we can also observe traffic here. What we're doing is Hubble observe and filtering on the uh, HTTP protocol. If we just do Hubble observe the dash dash protocol HTTP. We can see all the HTTP, HTTP traffic. This is not necessarily all the HTTP traffic on the cluster, to be honest. It's all the HTTP traffic that we can see because we have a layer seven network policy that applies to it. 
if we don't have a network layer seven network policy that applies to HTTP traffic, then this will just be seen as as TCP traffic. Yeah, uh, and I think we need to be able to filter. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's something may we need to point out, and we should add to the lab is there is consequence to you know applying layer seven policy and having that observability, right? There is a bit of latency introduced because you have to dive divert the traffic into Envoy for processing. Uh, it gives you the observability or the security, but adds you know a little a tiny amount of of latency. Yeah, it's definitely a trade-off. It's yeah. definitely a trade-off, but on the other hand, I mean, this is like a service mesh feature observing layer seven traffic, so it's a pretty cheap price for a service mesh feature. But yeah, yeah true. <laughs> cool. So we can see um, the traffic, and you've added some filters to this. Yeah, so we can actually see the traffic as JSON. It's not very readable, right? <laughs> so I took the I took the top. Uh, the top one, and I'm looking at the flow.l7 part, which shows that this is HTTP. It's a post request to this URL protocol, HTTP 1.1, and we can see all the headers. And what's interesting is that we can see that some headers were added by Envoy on the way between the TIE Fighter and the Death Star. So these, uh, these headers are not, uh, they don't come from the TIE Fighter. They don't come from our request. And we can see the replies as well. So here, if we look at the traffic, instead of from pod TIE Fighter, we can look at two pod TIE Fighter. And then we see the replies coming. So I should click on this. The replies coming from the test are going to the TIE Fighter. And uh, the, the headers are slightly different. Uh, there's an Envoy upstream service time. And there's a uh, request ID, which we still had here. So when I see this, I'm like, hey, if there's a request ID, most likely we can match the, the request ID from the request to the response. That would be pretty interesting because in layer three, we cannot do this with Hubble. We cannot match them. Um, also, I'd like to see the egress traffic. At the moment, this is only ingress traffic. And the reason is I only have one CNP at the moment. I only have one uh, Cilium network policy. And this Cilium network policy is an ingress network policy. So egress traffic is not filtered. Now, that still does the job, right? It still filters traffic between the TIE Fighter and, um, and the Death Star because there's two steps in traffic going from the TIE Fighter to the Death Star. There's the step that exits the TIE Fighter and goes into Cilium and then Envoy. That's egress. And then there is the step that goes from Cilium into the Death Star. That's the ingress on the Death Star side. And that's what we're filtering at the moment. But we could also visualize the egress traffic at layer seven by adding a layer seven policy for egress. So let's do this. Uh, where is this actually? Hmm. Some traffic. That's where you are. Oh, here. Why? Yeah. <laughs> so I actually added two network policies here. Why did I add two network policies? Because if I only add the TIE Fighter network policy, it's going to allow the traffic to go from the TIE Fighter to the Death Star. But the TIE Fighter is also making a DNS request in order to resolve the, the Death Star name. And so because I'm allowing, specifically allowing an, e an egress traffic in the namespace, I'm also going to deny anything else, any other egress traffic. And so DNS will be denied. So I need to allow DNS traffic. Here I'm allowing DNS traffic. I'm going to filter this. Uh, YP, YP spec. And so this is allowing egress to cube DNS on port 53 protocol any, because it could be TCP or UDP. And, uh, and the rule is allowing any DNS request. So now that this is applied, we can actually see HTTP egress traffic coming from the, the TIE Fighter going to the desktop. So that's egress traffic. Now let's look at the request IDs. The ID here, I'm going to observe traffic, means the default uh, protocol HTTP. And now we have all kinds of things in there. I'm going to get it in the JSON format and save it as some flows here. 
So flows.json, I have like, I don't know how many lines here. I have 40 lines of flows. This is just like recent flows. Um, now I'm going to extract, I'm going to do a big request here. <laughs> From the flows, I'm getting the first flow with, uh, that is coming from the TIE Fighter and is an egress traffic. I want the first egress flow, and I'm going to get the header uh, value for request ID. So this is the request ID for the first flow going from the, the TIE Fighter to desktop. And now with this, I'm going to look again into the flows and look at all the flows that use the same request ID. And here we can see that we have the egress traffic from the TIE Fighter to desktop. And then we have the ingress traffic from the TIE Fighter to desktop. So again, this is going from the TIE Fighter to Cilium, then to Envoy, and then to the desktop. This is egress. Ingress is going from Cilium, Envoy, and then the desktop. And then we have the, the, the response here, so type response, where the desktop is replying to TIE Fighter, but this is the same. Uh, it uses the same request ID. So it allows to pair uh, this four uh, flows together with the request ID. So this can be pretty useful as well. Understand what's happening. Cool. Right. So we've got the observability, we've got the security, and now we can also use Envoy for traffic management, layer seven. So I think the we have a couple of examples. We'll see how we get on on, on timing wise, but uh this is already uh yeah i think it'll be fine so we'll deploy yeah yeah we don't have tons of time so we're deploying an application that uses grp we can we can go on for a bit for a bit longer I will yeah 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 so here we're getting the um ip addresses and the ports for the services that were deployed and we can make yeah. grpc requests so let's deploy a pod. This pod uses NetShoot, which is uh, an, uh, a pod with lots of uh, networking tooling to make requests. Um, so this pod is still creating. Yeah, why is deploying? Let's just uh, take take a step by what we, we're showing here is um, going to be gRPC load balancing, right? And that's something yes. that is actually quite tricky to achieve by by default with with grpc in, uh, and in kubernetes you get typically what you you would have needed is either a service mesh or using headless services to be able to do that um it's just a way that so what's, the, what's, the what's the problem actually what's the problem we're trying to solve with this the, the the problem we try to solve is i think that the, the way grpc traffic is uh multiplexed in http2 uh essentially all the traffic is like within a single connection so doing the traditional load balancing at layer three layer layer four is not going to work because we only see like a big pipe of traffic so we need to have more of a layer seven awareness of the traffic so we could distribute it across different you know backends um there is uh, a good blog post which I can share that explains a bit, yes. uh, and that, that's written by uh, the the creator of of uh, Linkardi, and he suggests his his, uh, his solution. Uh, you can now obviously, uh, as we can show here, do it with uh, with with Cilium. Uh, so you've deployed uh, one of the standard. Uh, it's a Google microservices application, right? It's just using gRPC. Yes. Um, for um it's like online boutique platform um yes and in, yeah, about 12 microservices and then many of them talk using grpc um and we are going to see if we can yeah get the traffic kind of load balance through through the envoy that comes with it yeah so we have this pod worker uh using netshoot so this uh, uh tooling uh type of pod We've the, downloaded the, the protocol file for, uh, for this microservice. And now we can execute in the pod and we execute uh, a grp curl to the, the service uh, hipster shop uh, the product catalog, catalog service slash list products. So this is the service we're accessing. 
And for now, we're using the layer three, layer four uh, standard service in Kubernetes. So this, this works, right? But we're not, we're using layer three, layer four. And this is fine. We won't really see the difference in this lab uh, because we only have one request, right? So one request, one connection, this works fine. The problem starts in gRPC when you have multiple requests and they're supposed to be multiplexed in one connection. Uh, so we were thinking maybe in this lab eventually of using Fortio for this, uh, which is a library that it's a tool that uh, should be able to make multiple requests in the same connection uh, using gRPC multiplexing with HTTP2. And then we should see that it doesn't work. But we haven't had time yet <laughs> to actually add the demo with Fortio. Um, so what we see here is that there's no envoy, um, there's no envoy uh, header in the response, so it's not going through envoy. So we know it's going to be problematic because it's L3 L4. Um, same with the, the currency service here. We can access it, we can get the, the response, but there's no envoy um, header in the response. Um, now if we have a look here, we can see also that it's not going through the proxy. It's uh, it's standard two endpoint, um, two endpoint traffic. And if we look at traces that go through the proxy, there's nothing at the moment. So in the next step, we're going to actually um, allow this. And so this will be done by using. Uh, by using Envoy, obviously. And so we'll use Envoy as an internal load balancer. We could do it manually, but Cilium actually provides an abstraction for this. Um, so the first thing we need to do is actually enable the L7 uh, load balancer uh, backend. So using Envoy as the L7 load balancer. We're going to, again, upgrade Cilium with this option, loadbalancer.l7.backend equals Envoy. And here we actually need to manually restart um, the Cilium operator and the Cilium uh, agent. So we're going to wait for Cilium to be ready. Right, it should be fine. I don't know, it's still, oops, my bad. <laughs> uh, what I wanted to do is wait a little bit longer. Four, five, well, I restarted twice, you know, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it's quite quick. Yeah, it's pretty quick. So there we go. I think it's still something starting here. Just, just Hubble, I think. Yeah, probably Hubble. We should be fine. Yeah. Um, cool. So now we see Envoy config is actually enabled. So we can use Envoy configs. And this feature will actually generate a silly Envoy config under the hood. Uh, this is how it's implemented. And most Envoy related features now that were added after Cilium 112 actually generate Cilium Envoy configs. This is not the case for Cilium network policies because it was done before the Cilium Envoy configs were added to Cilium. So it's a different mechanism. But we can do here, okay. and we'll, we just annotate, sorry? Yeah, I was going to say we should also say that when we use, because it's not in the lab uh, in the demo today, but when we use the ingress, when we use Gateway API, we're also using Envoy because we're also doing layer seven processing. Yes, yeah, Gateway API and uh, and uh, and Ingress Control. Control. Yes, you use Envoy. That's true. So here, if we look at the metadata for the service, now we have uh, an annotation that we added: service that simply slash lbl seven enabled. And we uh, configured Cilium to use Envoy for this. So we can actually check in the gRPC uh, namespace. There are some CEC. So CEC stands for Cilium Envoy Config. There's two of them that are deployed. And we can look at them for the currency service. For example, it looks like this. So this is a big chunk, right? Cilium, it's Envoy Configuration. So this configures Envoy specifically for this service. So this is how you configure Envoy for layer seven load balancing. You won't get in, in the details, but you could actually apply this uh, yourself. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And just like yeah. this is, this is, um, it's almost like 
Selium pushes um, custom conf Envoy configuration for a specific filter, like um, for a specific use case, right? Yes, um, exactly. But yeah. it, it's almost like unidirectional. We don't uh, we don't know. That's the only kind of drawback with using this is we don't know whether the Selium Envoy proxy has accepted and implemented this. That there's no kind of reconciliation going happening. Um, this is well, part of the... Yeah, one drawback is that if you write the Selium Envoy config yourself, this, uh, this type of resource is very permissive. You can write pretty much what it is. There's not a lot of... Uh, of type yes. checking of what goes into this. So you'll only know if it's incorrect once you apply it and you check the Envoy logs typically um, yeah. and see yeah. that there's a problem there. Yeah. Especially here, because we have a separate Envoy daemon set. So the Cilium agent will actually take this resource, generate the, the, the Envoy configuration, and push it to Envoy via XDS. So if we make a request to the service now, uh, we still get an answer, but we see that it's going through Envoy. And because we go through Envoy and we know the configuration that was pushed, we know that if we were to make a request with multiple requests in one connection, so a multiplex request with gRPC, uh, it would be low balance properly because Envoy is able to manage this, uh, this use case. Um, same for the currency service. Right? This is the same use case, same, same result pretty much. All right, and now if we look at the, the two proxy uh, traces, we can actually see it. We see that this gRPC traffic is going through the proxy. So it says, Hubble says it's going through the proxy. So we can look at the last use case. So the last use case is pretty much, you know, we've seen different abstractions. So abstractions for, oh, the annotation has not been applied. Oh, okay. Uh, that's because, oh wait, that's that because I changed it. I fixed it, but not. Uh, let's see, I'll just take the, uh, we had a wrong annotation before. It was it was a previous annotation that we changed. So I fixed it in the instructions, but not, not in the check script. So I'm going to annotate it twice and we'll say this is okay. So we can switch to the, in the next challenge. Yeah, that should be fine, yeah. Um, so we have an abstraction here for the layer seven service load balancing, which generates a Cilium Envoy config. We have an abstraction for Cilium Network Policy. We have an abstraction for Observability. We have abstractions for North-South uh, uh, layer seven routing with Ingress and Gateway API. But there's still a lot of things you can do with Envoy where Cilium doesn't have an abstraction just yet. This is one example from the documentation. It's called it's circuit breaking. The idea of circuit breaking is a logic where you will stop access to a service if some condition is verified. Um, so in our case, we're going to create a namespace for this and deploy an application in this uh, in this uh, circuit break namespace. So there, the pod is creating. Look, I have an echo service in there. And the idea is we want to stop access to the SQL service. In order to protect it, we want to stop access if there is more than two requests uh, being processed and more than one request uh, being queued. If there's more than this, then we stop, we stop access to the service entirely. So Envoy allows to configure this. We can actually see what it looks like. Um, this is the configuration we're going to apply. It's pretty complex, right? The Cilium Envoy config. So it's got a listener that will uh, um, make Envoy uh, listen to traffic and, and process the traffic. It's got a route that will redirect all the traffic to the echo service. And it's got a cluster type, uh, which uh, will be the circuit breaker logic. And the circuit breaker logic says, uh, the maximum request for the circuit breaker, it is two, and the max pending request is one. So if we go over one of these two um, uh, thresholds, 
then it will break the secret and stop the route from function in order to protect the, the service that's uh, behind Envoy. Uh, so let's apply the secret breaker. We can verify that it was applied, right? Uh, you can notice here that this is a CCEC. It's not a CEC. It's a Selenium cluster Y and void config. It actually applies to the whole cluster. And this could be useful because here the logic only applies to one namespace. We could have logic that goes that takes one service from one namespace and breaks another service if uh, a condition applies to one of the services. Right? And then we're going to use the Fortio uh, pod. And Fortio is a request uh, app that will uh, make a test load. Um, a test load request, so it will send multiple requests down the line. So here we're going to send, so to control dash n secret break exec Fortio pod. We're going to exec in this Fortio pod. We'll exec uh, the Fortio command load. Uh, dash C two will be uh, the number of the the number of concurrent connections. Uh, we're not going to wait between the connections, and we're going to make uh, twenty requests in total to the service. If we do this, we just send twenty requests. <coughs> Sorry, and you see that ninety five percent went fine, and one uh, five percent of the requests, so one request, was actually rejected. You see, and why was this request rejected? The service is working fine. The reason why we get requests rejected is because there's too many requests. So the circuit breaker is, is uh, triggered. So Envoy is saying that's too many requests uh, in one go. So it replies with 503 to 5% 5 of the requests here. Uh, so here we're, we're pretty much, if we were to launch with C1 here, uh, we'll pretty much never see uh, 503, right? Because this is this is fine. We're only sending one connection at a time. This is fine. Now, if we increase and we send four connections at a time, then we're going to see a lot of 503. Because as soon as we send four connections, Envoy is going to say this is too much. So it's going to start replaying with 503 after two connections. So this is one way to like protect a service that cannot process too many requests and make sure that instead of breaking the service, it's Envoy that actually will divert the, the traffic. So in this case, it will replace with, with 503, but we could actually implement something more complex that would redirect to another service uh, as a, like a sorry page or something like this. So this is the kind of thing where Cilium doesn't have an abstraction yet, but you can still take advantage of the, the, the power features of Envoy to implement something in front of your services. That's pretty much it. We don't have the exam yet, and we wouldn't have time anyway. <laughs> yeah, it's um, I uh, I did uh, I was talking to a, a user uh, not that long ago actually, um, where yeah, I'm gonna show you my screen again. Um, that we're using this for another use case. Let me just uh, I was talking to Lars and Anton at a Danish company, if I'm not mistaken, called Demling Retail Company. And they were using the, um, the, the Cilium and the other proxy for uh, API authentication, which I thought was a really cool use case. Um, yeah. And using, uh, they were using key clock under the hood. And it was to even do things around like backstage uh, access from their, from backstage to their internal uh, services uh, using token based authentication, using the Cilium, the, the, the Envoy proxy that comes with Cilium. So there are lots of, you know, potential use case, right? Everything that uh, you do with Istio uh, and you do with, with, with Envoy, any service mesh, you can now, you should be able to do it with, um, with Selenium. In some way, yes. There's actually going to be a, a KubeCon talk about this by, um, by engineers at Roche uh, from Switzerland. 
will talk about how they use uh, Cilium with Envoy and Cilium network policies in order to force traffic through an HTTP proxy. So they have they have um, clusters that are um, like edge clusters, like one node clusters that need to go through a proxy to access a centralized service. And they want to make sure that they go through the proxy. So essentially, they use a specific um, parameter in Cilium network policies, which is listener at, at layer seven. So once layer three, layer four get validated, there is a listener parameter in the Cilium network policy, which uh, lets you specify which uh, Cilium Envoy config you want to use, which Cilium Envoy listener you want to use next once the traffic is forwarded from the Cilium network policy. And there they have a listener that sets up uh, a tunnel to their uh, proxy using WebSocket. So it allows them to force the traffic through a WebSocket to the proxy using a Cilium network policy plus the Cilium Envoy config. It's a pretty elegant solution. Yeah. So you'll be able to actually listen to the whole, all the details at QCon when they talk about it. Cool. Wow. Um, that was cool. Yeah. Brand new uh, exclusive lab uh, look at our new lab. Uh, thank you, everybody. Hopefully, we'll be able to finish this lab soon and people will yeah. be able to get a badge for it. <laughs> exactly. Um, well, we've been going for an hour and 12 minutes. Uh, I would say I think we'll leave it there. Um, Thank you, everybody, for joining. Raphael, any final words? No, this is never final. <laughs> <laughs> See you another time. All right. See you, everybody. Thanks again. Bye.